tonight Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40 be our text this evening. And we've been especially enjoying the study and the preaching as we've been going through Isaiah. And this uh, really ties up a lot of, ties together a lot of things. If you study Isaiah in the scripture, you really recognize a lot of God's promises, first of all, future things that he would do. We're in that place in Isaiah right now where we're seeing uh, a lot of prophetic literature, prophetic material. And actually, tonight's message uh, is a message that I think is one that is very, very timely in the day and the age in which we live right now, because in particular, uh, and what we'll mostly focus on this evening, is on the preservation of God's Word. I believe that probably, I haven't lived in more than the generation that I was born in, but I believe that probably more people today do not have the concept of God's having preserved His Word than probably there has been, that has probably been true of Christianity or Christians in general at any other time in life. It's amazing to me when you suggest to people that God's Word is perfect and preserved, it's amazing how many people would just immediately disagree with that. Not because they thought through it, not because they intended to disparage or attack the Word of God, but simply because that's what they've always thought, that they've always been taught. And this is a passage of Scripture in the Old Testament of the Scripture that really, really deals with preservation and has some other wonderful prophecy in it. We will actually spend the next couple of weeks in Isaiah chapter 40 because there are some marvelous truths that teach us about the character of God in this portion of the Scripture. So let's begin reading this evening in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 1. And I love the beginning of the transitional words in chapter 40. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. For she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And I can preach a message from those first two verses. And it would help you to understand God's people very well and the hardship that, has, that they have undergone and are continuing to over, undergo. And a lot of it is because she's dealing double for her sins. And so this is a prophecy of comfort for those same people. Then verse 3, we see the near fulfillment of that prophecy. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Verse 6. The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our Lord, or the word of our God, shall stand forever. I'll read that last verse one more time. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. Amen. Father, please help us tonight as we go to Your Word to not only believe it, but God, to have it make such an impression that it is indelibly printed in our minds that You promised in Isaiah chapter 40 that the Scripture, not simply spoken words, random words that Jesus spoke, but the Word of God would endure forever. And I pray that based on this confidence that, Lord, we would look more to what Your Word says than even our own experience. And we would look more to what Your Word says than man's meager wisdom. And I pray that as a result of it, God, we would both have greater confidence and also we would see answers to promises that are in the Scripture and that we would enlighten others with the same. Help us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is a loaded passage of Scripture. How many of you have a hard time reading words like comfort to you without starting to break out into like opera music <laughs> a little bit? If I didn't have such a, an innate disdain for opera music, and I'm sorry for those that I'm offending this evening, that just, you know, the live, breathe, eat, sleep opera music, um, but I, I, I cannot help it. I'm just not an opera guy and will not be, but comfort you. Hey. Comfort ye my people. I hear that. I do love Handel's Messiah, and I love uh, some of the references in there. 
and then Amen. every valley shall be exalted. Now this is this is a passage of scripture that has made a real impression. I mean, a couple of years ago we were preaching through Mark. Actually, we spent a good bit of time looking at verse 4 of Isaiah chapter 40. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. Now, nothing happens accidentally. Nothing happens by accident. And I think that is of the Lord that I have a witness here this evening in, from Kansas. Because here's the deal. Kansas, this, this doesn't have to do with the message right now. <laughs> but growing up in Kansas, you get picked on all the time. All the time. Where are you from, Kansas? First of all, they crack the Dorothy joke. You know, have you seen Toto? Uh, oh, you know. And then they start to talk about the topographical uh, features of Kansas. And they start by saying, yeah, that I've never seen such a flat place. They're liars. They're like people that tell you that they've read the whole Bible. <laughs> you know, the, people, the Bible's full of mistakes. And you ask, have you read it? Oh, yes, I have. You know, it's like that's like the people that tell you that Kansas is is Kansas flat? Where are you from? Not, not hardly is it. Are. Thank you very much. Kansas does not get flat until you get near Colorado. Yes. And it's Colorado that's flat. Matter of fact, The Wizard of Oz was filmed in Colorado, folks. No kidding. The yellow brick road is in Colorado. And so it's all lies. It's all fake. It's like the westerns, you know, that are filmed in California. They're not filmed in Kansas either. And we don't have like these tall cactuses and Anyway, it's it's really tough to be from somewhere and have people when you start talking about things being flat. Now, were Kansas flat, then it would be described in verse 3, but actually it's Colorado, actually. Eastern Colorado is where it's flat. You could stand on a stump in eastern Colorado and you can avoid the curvature of the earth for like maybe, I don't know, 50 miles or something and actually see straight to the Rockies like a couple hundred miles away. So... That's maybe an exaggeration. But Colorado doesn't get the rap that Kansas does, even though it's flatter in, in places than Kansas is. So I'm just taking my chance this evening to set the record straight. Hopefully as publicly as possible. Go and tell others also if they need more. Um, anyway, uh, that's a little bit for your entertainment. But actually, verse 3 has made a profound impression on me. The reality of it, I love what the Bible says, every valley shall be exalted. You know what that means, right? It means every low place is going to be brought, brought level, brought up. And it says every high place, every, uh, every mountain and hill shall be made low. And then it says, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. Now here is something that is true about Kansas. We do not drive over hills in Kansas. Don't do that. What do they do in Kansas? They blast through and create a road. So it's true. You know. So you do get to drive on a flat level road because it makes sense to the people in Kansas to not go up and down hills. You know, it's way better for your fuel economy and for other reasons to uh, you know, just cut a hill through the, through the, or cut a road through the hills. But actually, I, actually I, I do think of this. I think of areas where there are a lot of hills and instead of going up and down over hills or curving around, them actually just cutting a straight channel through. And the idea here, of course, is this is a prophecy of the ministry of John the Baptist. Go read with me, if you, if you will, please, to Mark chapter 1. And I'd like to look at what the Scripture says. Mark chapter 1 and uh, beginning... By the way, I'm not Mormon. Uh, I do not think that fanciful places in America or you know, the spiritual places in the Bible or anything like that. So Kansas... Uh, it only exists for our day, but it's it's not mentioned in the Scripture anywhere, just in case you think I've gone too far. Maybe I have. Mark chapter 1, and the Bible says in verse 2, As is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, verse 3, Prepare you the way of the Lord, make his paths straight, and then instantly were introduced to the one who did so, John. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And so we know that Isaiah chapter 40, according to the Word of God, is, is a prophecy of John, John the Baptist. And this is, this is I, love, I love actually studying the ministry of John the Baptist. What Jesus said about John the Baptist. Remember what Jesus said about John the Baptist as a man? He said that there's never been a man who's greater than than John the Baptist. And he said, nevertheless, he said there's, he's, he would be the least in the kingdom of heaven. So really gives you an idea of heaven. It gives you an idea of earth. But with regard to men, to have Jesus say something like, 
there's never been a man like John the Baptist, I would look at a man like John the Baptist and say, well, that would be, in God's eyes, the way that God views greatness, that would be a man who literally was great God's way. That would be John the Baptist. And the reason John the Baptist was great was really foundational in his ministry. His ministry was one of literally straightening paths, uh, uh, raising valleys, lowering mountains and hills, and straightening crooked ways so that you had a straight, uh, straight shot to Jesus Christ and the cross of Jesus Christ. And that literally is the ministry of John the Baptist. Now, I've said that in so many words, but I'm telling you that, that those words have made an impact in my life. Literally, every one of us ought to see ourselves and our lives as a pathway to Jesus Christ for others. In other words, just get everything, every obstruction, everything that would distract from the Lord Jesus, whether it be something about us personally or whether it would be something that would stand in the way of Jesus and literally make the pathway straight to the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we pray like this sometimes when we're doing something special for outreach and so forth, don't we? You ever pray and say, God, please help there not to be anything in the service that will be a distraction? What does that mean? Well, we don't, we want, we don't want to have to go around something or get, have something that would uh, be an object or an obstacle that would keep us from having a straight vision right to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that really was John the Baptist's ministry. I love John the Baptist. Remember when John the Baptist was told that Jesus was making more disciples than he did. Remember that? And what he said, he said, hey, the servant isn't greater than his master. And he said, he's not, you're not greater than your Lord. And literally, John the Baptist understood it's, it's actually one of those verses of the Scripture where John the Baptist literally understood that his ministry was over because Christ had now come and the person who he had preached, the person who he had proclaimed was now here and therefore he was done. His ministry was over, it was finished. And that the one that was greater than him had taken that place. And my friend, if you and I could just simply grasp the concept of realizing that it isn't about us, it isn't about somebody looking and saying, that's a great man of God, or that's a great woman, or that's a person who's done great things. But literally, somebody would look right past us and say, that's a great Savior, that's a great Jesus. Amen. That's a wonderful ministry. And so there's a real message here that's prophesied in Isaiah chapter 40. Why was John great? Because John the Baptist glorified his Savior. And so uh, that, is, that is that portion of the Scripture. There's a lot more that could be said. We could preach that portion. But I really want to get uh, to the Scripture itself here in just a moment. Verse 5, uh, the Bible says, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. It's interesting to me, and I'm not one who compares versions of the Scripture. I reject in the English language other versions of the Scripture uh, aside from the King James Version of the Bible. I don't mean to be unkind or demeaning to any person that wouldn't agree with me about that, but I'll be quite honest with you, this, this version of the Scripture, and Again, I don't say 1611 or 1769 or 1613 to get caught up in that. But this version, or this translation of the Scripture reflects the attitude by the translators that the Word of God was both perfectly given as well as preserved. And it's very interesting to me that beginning in verse 6, if you were to cross-reference, and I did it accidentally today. I was just Googling. Uh, the, I can't remember why, but I, I Googled this verse and I got the NIV version of it. And it said, all people are as grass. And I thought, that's a terrible translation. It's absolutely prophetic. The idea of it, of all people is as grass, would be much, much embraced, I suppose, by the Jehovah's Witnesses, who believe that people die and they cease to exist. And the idea here is that flesh is as grass. And the Scripture here is making a very, very plain reference to the fact that every one of us has an eternal soul, but we live in a body which is temporary, just as temporary as the glass, grass of the field or as the flower of the field. And so it's a... You know, I, I, I'm not into the, the versions of the Scripture that would try to translate and use a different word so that we can relate to it better. You know, the Bible's talking about people here. Well, friend, I don't mean to be demeaning or unkind, but if you don't understand that flesh is talking about the body that we live in here, then I just explained it to you. So you're ahead of the curve, I guess, as far <laughs> as that goes this evening. But people are not the physical manifestation or the physical thing that you see. I'm not this body that you see which happens to be particularly handsome and strong and so forth. The fact of the matter is that's not me. You could cut this hand off or this arm off and I'd still be me. You could cut all my arms off and cut my legs off and I'd be, you know, maybe, I don't know what you call a guy without arms and legs. What they call it? It's not nub man. Quadriplegic. Quadriplegic. Well, no, quadriplegic is when they don't function. 
but I'd be without those entirely. And so I'd be that, but I'd still be me. In other words, if you took my arm or my leg or my hand, you could take things off of this body and I could live without them and I could still be me. So the Bible's not saying all people is as grass. The Bible's saying all flesh is as grass. One day, if the Lord Jesus tarries, and I hope that He will not, but if the Lord Jesus tarries, one day this body will cease to breathe. The heart will cease to pump. His lungs will cease to inhale air. And that will be when God makes the decision that that will do that. I have an appointment one day if, if the Lord tarries. But the reality of the matter is, is that I have eternal life, and I've had it ever since the moment I trusted Jesus as my Savior. And if you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you're an eternal being. And so you as a person are not as grass. Your flesh is as grass. Now, friend, this ought to help us to have a perspective and an insight into life, oughtn't it? You know, sometimes I think uh, we almost get into a little bit of a panic mode when we recognize how fast life goes by. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to me how fast life goes. And I, uh, I, I, I tell you what, I, some folks would say I'm not even old yet. I hope I'm not old yet. But uh, the reality of it is I look at life and how fast it's going, and I think I'm not long for this world if the Lord Jesus tarries and if I get the average then I'm not, I'm not very long for it. The reality is I have no idea what the Lord Jesus will give me to live, but life is very, very fleeting, very vanishing. Now this grass thing is a personal illustration for me as well. We, I grew up on a farm in Kansas, and I kind of know how to grow things. But one of the toughest things I've ever tried to grow is grass in South Florida. Grass in South Florida is perhaps the most susceptible to the most things possible. You know, usually sun... You know, sun, fertilizer, and water, and you can make things grow if you keep hail or something from getting it. But not so in South Florida. We have things called chinch bugs that will eat your roots out of your grass. If you don't water your grass, it'll die just, I mean, just so stinking fast. It's terrible. But if uh, I have, like right now, my lawn is dark green. looks absolutely terrific, except for the massive dead spots in it, you know, in my front yard. And I've been telling you, since, I, since we bought our house almost four years ago, I've been fighting, been doing battle with my grass, trying to grow the grass. And last summer, it looked beautiful, didn't it, Melissa? I mean, I finally had, like, our front yard, it finally had killed the weeds. And, you know, you can't kill the weeds. Nothing kill anything that kills the weeds that grow in my lawn also kills the grass. And so I tried that one time. I killed all the weeds and also killed all the grass. <laughs> and so I had to recover from that. Last, but So what happens is I get up in the morning or sometime while I'm walking by and I just start pulling weeds out with my fingers, fighting those weeds. And if I do, if I, if I every single day pull on the weeds for quite a while, the weeds also have a way of wrapping themselves around the grass and pulling that out with it. And uh, it's amazing. It just takes a week or two for the weeds to get away. So the weeds are an enemy of the grass. Uh, the chinch bugs, that's a, that's a word that shouldn't even exist, but it really is a word they call these bugs that live underneath the ground, eat the roots out. And then, uh, if you do a good job with your grass, one of the things you realize is it needs a lot of water. But if you don't water your grass exactly right in South Florida, you'll overwater it. Or you'll water it at the wrong time. And so in the middle of the, if you water it too early in the morning, then what will happen is that a mildew will grow on it and fungus will grow on it and it'll kill the grass. And then if you put a fungicide on it to kill the fungus on the grass, then the ability of the bacteria to break down all of the, the clippings and so forth that comes on it goes away, and then your grass gets choked out by the little pieces of grass that fall. It's tough to grow grass in South Florida. I'm telling you something, I can have a beautiful, beautiful lawn and go on vacation for two weeks and have somebody come by and cut my lawn wrong while I'm out of town and I'll come back three weeks. It happened to us, didn't it, last year, Melissa? I went away for three weeks last year. I didn't cut my grass for three weeks, and somebody else did. And I'm telling you, literally, in that space of time, my, my grass withered. And uh, it, it is, it, it's amazing to me what an illustration the grass is. Because I, I personally just tell you this. I used to say when I was young that I think that everybody ought to just pour concrete on their lawns <laughs> and paint it green. And that would be the simplest thing to do. Why in the world I haven't done that, I don't know at all. But I'm going to tell you, grass does not last. <laughs> it uh, vanishes. I've been, I've been noticing on door to door, more people are using that turf stuff in their front lawns. And it's really amazingly deceptive. You know, it looks really good from a distance. I'm like, wow, that yard looks good. And I realize it's fake. And then, uh, so I'm thinking about, you know, if I can't afford concrete, maybe the turf thing may be the way to go. That's just free for you guys. It has nothing to do with anything at all this evening. But the point of the grass is that literally the life that we live, my friend, is very, very, very 
deflating. Mm -hmm. Solomon really, really had a lot to say about it in Ecclesiastes. And when he wrote about how that, the, that everything in life that has to do with the grass part, the things that, that exist in the short time that we have to live on this earth, everything in that short time is just a vanity. When you look back at your life, I, I, that song bothers me more and more when I sing, I wonder if I've done my best for Jesus. You ever try to be honest about that? So I wonder if I've done my best for Jesus. And it compares what Jesus has done for me versus what I've done. Just, just forget about trying to answer that question. Of course you haven't. Of course I haven't done my best for Jesus. But when I think about the short life that I have on this earth, and I think what James said when he said that our life is a vapor, it tears for a while and it vanishes, just poof, a little space in time. And I realize how true that is. Then all of a sudden I recognize how important it is that I, that I understand the difference between my eternal soul and between this physical short life that I have the opportunity to live. And how important it is that the things in this life that really don't matter, you know, you can spend your whole life uh, trying to get over a health problem and still die. You can spend your whole life uh, trying to accumulate some things that will make life comfortable and still die. It's amazing how much effort and work we put into things that are trying to preserve something which is as easy to preserve as my grass in my front lawn. Friend, if you want to compare your life to my grass in my front lawn, you don't have much. That's the reality of it. And so the rea the, what, what the Scripture is indicating to us this evening is that there's something that's greater, there's something that's bigger. And so here's the message that John the Baptist is told to cry. The voice said, verse 6, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? Here's the message. All flesh is grass, and all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. We have some little plants out front here that had, on Easter Sunday looked fantastic. And all the flowers are gone on them right now. I watered them today and I thought, man, those things, they're made to bloom, I think, right around this time of the year. But it's, that's it. They, they have beautiful flowers on them for Easter Sunday. looked really nice. They're, they're dead and gone now. The plants are alive. The flowers are gone. The Bible says the grass withereth, the flower fadeth. And it goes on to say, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it, surely the people is grass. And then verse 8 makes it, ties it up and brings us to the point that we're supposed to be impressed by. And I hope you'll be impressed with this point this evening. It's our only one, really, when it comes down to it. Verse 8, the Bible says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Now, I've had a lot of people that try to help me to understand that God is not talking about His word when He's talking about His word here. You ever have somebody patronize you just a little bit? They'll talk about in Matthew where the Bible says, that uh, till uh, heaven and earth shall pass away, not one jot or one tittle shall pass away uh, from the law till all be fulfilled. And they try to tell you, well, they're, they're talking about, you know, there that's, that doesn't exactly mean God's Word. It doesn't really mean the yove or the, you know, the little dash line. It means, and I've had people try to explain, God's not promising that He preserve His Word. You know, Psalm 12, 6 and 7, the Bible says, The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth purified seven times. And it says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them. And, and the author says, from this, from this generation forever. And I want to submit to you this evening that if there is no concept such as preservation, and I could be speaking to the choir this evening, but if there is no concept such as preservation in the Word of God, then the folks that were alive that read and believed the promises of the Messiah, the promises of a Savior, those individuals to whom Isaiah is being used to prophesy the Word of God, they didn't have much to go on because that's what they believed it meant. You say, Pastor, I think that they were just thinking the specific things that God said. Don't you know that, that Jesus said things that weren't in the Bible? I know. I've read the Gospel of John. I love the conclusion of John, by the way, where John says that uh, the, the works that Jesus did, if they were written in a book, he supposed that the whole world could not contain the things that would be written. And that's great for me to have a sample size to recognize that everything that's included in the Word of God and the Gospel that has to do with this is what Jesus did is such a, such a sample size or such a small, uh, small perspective of the works that Jesus did that there wouldn't be anyone alive who could deny that the things that He did was God. I, I can totally relate to what Nicodemus said when he came to Jesus and he said, Master, we know that that our teacher come from God. For no man can do the miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Why did Nicodemus acknowledge that Jesus came from God? Because he was honest about everything that Jesus did. But my friend, just because Jesus did things that aren't written in the Word of God, and Jesus said things 
that aren't recorded in the Scripture does not mean that God's Word is not talking about God's Word. So let's prove that. And let's go to 2 Peter chapter 1 this evening. 2 Peter chapter 1. And you say, Pastor, why is this so important? Well, I'll tell you why it's so important. Uh, I have had a couple of times in my life people who are struggling to relate, struggling to relate to apostasy, or that is wandering away from the truth of the Scripture and from the authority of the Word of God. And they have a hard time relating to them, and they, ask, they come and ask me, Pastor, what is going on? What are these people thinking? And I'll tell you what they're thinking. They're thinking that the Word of God isn't preserved. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain that to you here momentarily. I don't think that living today bothers me with regard to what wicked people say, what wicked people think, and what wicked people try to accomplish. What those individuals do doesn't bother me near so much is how much and how far from the truth individuals that name the name of Jesus have gone. In other words, it doesn't, doesn't upset me uh, when people are perverted. They're in the homosexual lifestyle. I, I'm not saying I'm for that. I'm not saying I condone that. But I can understand where people that are lost are just wicked. And they do things that the Bible calls sin. It doesn't bother me. You know what really bothered me uh, was, was this past year uh, when the Supreme, Supreme Court ruled? Was it the year before? It was the year before last, was it? Okay, years go so fast. 2015. When the Supreme Court ruled to redefine... Uh, what marriage is. And by the way, no court can define marriage. And tradition or not tradition has nothing to do with it. It has to do with what God made marriage to be. But it didn't bother me that a couple of appointed judges went renegade and disrespected the people of the United States who voted saying that they didn't approve of that, didn't want that. And that a few judges said, well, we don't care about the law. We don't care about the people. This is our personal opinion. And we're going to force it on on the world. I'll tell you what bothered me more was all the Christians on Facebook posting posting their approval of that amendment. That's what bothered me. As a matter of fact, it shocked me, actually. I, I would say, and I, I guess I'm old enough now to be shocked by things, but it, it amazed me how many people, without thinking, stood up for transgender, stood up for lesbian, bisexual, so on, those words that, that are used to define that movement. That stood up for those things. You know what I thought about it? I thought, you know what, there are people in my neighborhood that are in that lifestyle and they don't agree with it. In other words, they're involved in that sin and they believe it's sin. And yet people who purport themselves to be followers of Jesus Christ have said, well, the Bible is locked into a culture and a time in which things were said and things were spoken that really don't represent God. In other words, the Bible has errors and it has mistakes in it. And so God, yeah, God's not hateful and He would be against. He wouldn't call something like that sin when He made people that way. The Bible says God didn't make people that way, That's right. actually. Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not ranting about homosexuality this evening. I'll be honest with you. I found that the response to the homosexual movement is the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That will solve it. That will fix the problem of it. I don't, I'm not against people that are homosexual any more than I'm against people who are adulterers or people who are murderers or people who are liars or people who are sinners because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Jesus died for their sin. And by God's grace, He can save and change lives. And I've not only believed it, but I've experienced it. I've seen it happen. And I know what God can do. But what bothers me is believers who think that they are being accepting and think that they're being loving. In other words, I'm more loving than God is, is what they actually mean. And I'm more accepting than God is. I'm more merciful. I'm more long-suffering than God Himself. And it bothers me what they think. And you say, Pastor, how can they think like that? They think like that because they believe that God's Word has mistakes. Mm -hmm. They believe God's Word doesn't mean what it says, or they believe that it was, it has man's taint to it, or man's has written it. But I want to say to you this evening that if God's Word is true, it's either all true or it's none true. Yeah. There's no in between. The reality of it is is that I, I know many people, I have spoken to people in the last couple of months that have said things like, well, I do believe that God gave His Word, but I don't think that you could prove that God preserved His Word. Or as people have said, well, yes, God, God spoke to men. 
My question is, if God spoke to men, did He speak specifically, did He speak clearly, and did He speak accurately? And were those men able to write specifically, clearly, and accurately what God told them to write? All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Most people would say, and they're talking about textual transmission. They're talking about the way that God used in giving His Word to a man and man writing His Word. Most people would acknowledge that God gave His Word perfectly. But you know, if you go to the average church in America, and I'm not talking about you know far out there denominational things. I'm talking about Baptist churches. I'm talking about churches that are non-denominational the way Baptists have always been. Baptist, you know, means non-denominational. It's non-denominational way before it's cool. And you go to churches that claim to believe that the Bible's the Word of God, and you find out that the people there would say, but God never said He'd preserve His Word. I've, I've read this. This is on the average Baptist website. You don't believe me? Look it up. We believe that the Bible is the... I've heard, I, they don't use the words infallible and inerrant. If they don't use the words infallible and inerrant, they don't believe in preservation normally. Now, that may not be true. But we believe that the Bible is the Word of God and that it is perfectly preserved, and that's, they'll qualify it by saying, in the original copies. If you follow up that statement with the question, do we have the original copies, the answer is no. No, we don't. We've lost them. They've been lost. We're not sure exactly what belongs, what doesn't belong in the original copies. Now, we're going to teach a series in a couple of weeks, actually, in our church on why we use the King James Version of the Scripture. And we're going to deal with the fact that we do have the preserved Word of God, and we have it in perfect copies. And it's, it ought to be a real help, hopefully, to every person here, and especially to people who have never thought about it. But you say, Pastor, where are people coming from? Well, people believe that God gave His Word, but they don't believe that God preserved His Word. And as such, they think that man has put his bent or his emphasis on it, or that God never intended for us to take His Word as an absolute, infallible authority. That is, the principles and the ideas, and especially they'll say the things that have to do with salvific doctrine. Things that have, you know, important doctrine is not affected by mistakes in the Bible but there are mistakes in the Scripture. Friend, I have to say to you, either, either that statement is fallacious or this book is worthless. A Christian who believes the Bible has mistakes and it has no authority. Sometimes individuals, I'll deal with believers who are, who are what the Bible teaches is sinning sin or doing their brother who sinned. And I'll take the Word of God to them and I'll say, listen, this is what the Bible very plainly, very clearly says. And I'll have people say, well, I know that's what the Bible says, but I'm going to go ahead and do thus and so. And I wonder, what are they thinking? How can they think along those lines? I'll tell you how they can think along those lines, because they believe the Bible has mistakes. And if you believe the Bible has mistakes, you get to pick and choose where you think the mistakes are at. And so you can believe anything that you, that you want to or don't want to. So if it applies to you, then, then uh, you don't have to believe it, because maybe it's an area of error or mistake. We've lost our families over this, by the way. I don't mean to rant this evening, but the church, statistically, and there are some, some good reasons why, but there's also bad reasons why, statistically, the church has the same statistics or worse statistics, actually, and I'm speaking of just generally like Barna Research kind of statistics, evangelicals, has the same kind of stats for marriage and divorce as the lost people do. Now, I will contend that more Christians get married than lost people, and so the statistics are skewed. They're not, they're not a fair representation because a lot of people just don't bother with marriage anymore because marriage is a recognition of God who, who created marriage and said that there's going to be, that uh, it's, a, it's a man and a wife and these two are one flesh. However, you recognize that more marriages are broken up in the church house than anywhere else? And God's Word has a lot to say about that, my friend. I'm not picking on anybody this evening if you've been divorced, if you've been remarried, but the Bible calls it adultery. And I've had more Christians tell me that God doesn't mean what He said when Jesus said exactly what He meant about it. He said it was not so from the beginning. And it was very, very plain, very, very clear about it. And in the church, I'm going to tell you, in, in the fundamental church, we have, we have literally destroyed Bible authority by preachers getting involved with helping people commit adultery. And it's so rampant, it's, it, it's absolutely heartbreaking. We've lost more people in this church for agreeing with what God's Word says about that. And I wonder, how could another pastor in town that claims that he believes all the same things I do, how could he go along with something that the Word of God forbids? Mm -hmm. How could he do it? How could, how could so many people, I'll tell you how, because of this. Mm -hmm. Because of numbers. 
but ultimately it's because they don't believe God's word is preserved. Because they've got on their website things like it's it's inerrant in the it don't have in the originals. But it isn't preserved. And my friend, I'm not a re inspirationist. I'm not I'm not way out there, I'm not nuts or anything like that. I don't believe that this that, that this version of the scripture, this printing corrects the originals. I just believe it represents the originals and the originals are preserved. And I believe that this book is a book that is represented. You want to you want to back me in the corner and say, Pastor, do you believe that the King James Version of the Bible is preserved? And I'll say, yeah, I do. I do. I think any believer with the help of the Holy Spirit can know exactly what God says from believing this book. Now, let's look at it real quickly. You say, Pastor, I think that they're talking about just God's Word. I'm, you know, anything Isaiah said that God told him to say, maybe it wasn't recorded. It was the Word of God. Well, here we are in 2 Peter chapter 1. And uh, I would like to look at verse 15 where Peter has just said that he's going to die soon. Verse 15, he said, Moreover, I'll endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. Now, how could something be always in remembrance? Well, the best way when people are dead that would remember things is to have those things written, isn't it so? And so he goes on to say for, in verse 16, For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we, were made, when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Verse 17, For he received from God the Father honor and glory, when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now when did that voice come from the excellent glory? That was on the Holy Mount, wasn't it? The Mount of Transfiguration. Peter, James, and John had an experience on the Mount of actually seeing Christ in His glorified body. And they said, you know, listen, Peter's saying, I'm very much a believer that Jesus is God. And one of the experiences I personally had was that I saw Him in His glory as God. Now, they liked it so much that they said, hey, it's good for us to be here. Let's build tabernacles. Let's build places to live, and we'll just stay here. We like, this is amazing, being with Jesus glorified as God. So they're saying, we're eyewitnesses of His majesty, and by eyewitness, Peter is saying, my witness, I am telling you myself that I saw Jesus as God. Now, he'd seen Christ on the cross. He'd seen Christ resurrected from the grave, and he watched Christ ascend into heaven. So he'd also seen Jesus on every single day do miracles that proved that he was God. He was the one, Peter was, who when Jesus said, who do men say that I am? They said, well, I say you're John the Baptist, I say you're Moses, I say you're Elias. He said, who do you say that I am? And Jesus said, thou art the Christ. And so Peter believed that Jesus was God. He witnessed it himself. He knew it was true. And I'll tell you something, Peter say so, it, it, it means something to me. Doesn't it to you? Peter said, he's God, and I'm telling you, I saw it. I saw him glorified as God. It means something to me. But notice this. In verse 19, Peter said, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Peter said, you got my word on it. I saw Jesus glorified as God. I'm telling you, we were eyewitnesses, and I can show you other people that have seen him glorified as God, but he said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. In other words, there's a better witness than my witness and he goes on to say exactly what it is. He said, Whereunto you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. My friend, if ever there was a need for a light to shine in a dark place, the need is today. There is as much darkness, I will not say there's more, but there is as much darkness as there has ever been in this day. And there is too little of the light. Amen. And if you want to know what the, what the light is, it's the Word of God. He says, As unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. And he goes on to say, Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. That's helpful to me. I've had people say, Well, that's your interpretation. I say, I don't get to have an interpretation, actually. I get to be taught the Word of God. You know, if there ever ought to be somebody who's wide open-minded, it ought to be believers. It's amazing how closed-minded people are who accuse you of being open-minded. I picked up a homeless guy uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I had a pretty good time with him, actually. He was in my neighborhood, and I actually, I'll be honest with you, I didn't want him prowling around my house, and so I gave him a ride. And when I gave him a ride, I started, I had uh, 611, whatever that station is, and, and uh, one of the guys that rants all or yammers all day about politics, about Donald Trump. Donald Trump's like, he's the news for the next, what? 7-Eleven, 6-Eleven. No, 6-Eleven. That's the, that's the station. But the guy that, you know, one of them, yeah, Sean Hannity or Rush Limbaugh, one of them was talking about something. So I asked the guy, I said, you a Trump supporter? 
I love doing that. By the way, if you ever want to have a good time, just go somewhere and say, you're a Trump supporter, aren't you? To a random person, and especially in Southeast Florida. It's a lot of fun. It's amazing. And then, then don't believe them if they say they're not. Well, yes, you are. I know you are. You're a Trump supporter. And so I've done it. And it's, I'm telling you, it's a lot of fun. Matter, see, I'm about to tell story after story. We don't want to do this. You guys want to go home, right? Okay, so I won't tell you a story about that. But this guy said, he said, I don't talk politics with anyone. I said, why? He said, my, my, I was taught, I was raised, you don't talk about religion, you don't talk about politics. I said, are they unimportant? And he said, well, I said, come on, talk to me about politics. And you don't talk to me about politics, let's talk about Jesus. Oh, I don't want to talk about it. I don't, I don't, I don't want to. I said, are you too close-minded? I said, are you afraid that what you believe is going to be challenged by alternatives? And that the truth of it is going to shake your very existence? Okay, now let me, let me just, let's just think about this for a second. Here's a guy who's homeless. Now, whatever his worldview is, could we agree, not being critical or picking on the guy, but could we agree that his worldview is not functioning well? In other words, he wasn't happy about being homeless. He didn't want to be homeless, but he was. And so whatever he thinks about life, whatever he thinks about politics, and whatever he thinks about religion, could we say that it's possible that if his views were challenged, he could be helped by it? And so I spent about four miles of driving, harassing the poor fellow, and explained to him, saying, hey, listen, you need to be open-minded, man. Closed-minded people. I said, if you're going to hell, wouldn't you like to know it? Well, wouldn't it be important to know? I'm going to tell you, most people are so closed-minded, they, 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 they just believe rhetoric about things you can't think about. But you know, sometimes Christians are that way, too. Sometimes Christians, if they don't like what you're about to say, they're not interested in whether or not the Word of God teaches it. If it opposes their denominationalism or their, their affiliations, they're afraid it's going to, to, to drive a wedge between them and a friend or something like that. They don't want to be challenged. You know, as a believer, we don't interpret the Scripture. We believe it. We obey it. And so we study it. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, I've said this for years, and I believe it is absolutely as true as it's ever been, that if you study the Word of God with the help of the Holy Spirit, and if I study the Word of God with the help of the Holy Spirit, and I've got an open mind, you've got an open mind, we will be in absolute unity about the, what the Word of God says. And that's precisely what it means when it says that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now, in order for the Word of God to not be of any private interpretation, my friend, it's important that it is actually preserved. Because the reality of it is, is that if it's got changes in it, then it's changes on the basis of somebody's interpretation, isn't it so? Mm -hmm. I read this evening in Isaiah, and I read how that it called grass, it called flesh, people instead of flesh. And I'm going to tell you something, that's an important mistake. The fact of the matter is, is if people are as grass, then you don't have eternal life. See, you could go into the grave, you'll die when your flesh dies, but that isn't so, is it? person who's in Christ never has eternal life, and they're never going to perish. No one's ever going to pluck you out of the Father's hand. Right. And that's an important distinction, because the Word of God means what it says, and it's preserved as such. Now, now let's get to the prophecy, or let's get to what the Word of God is saying. In verse 21, the Bible says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Friend, I have to say to you this evening that it is not man that spoke, but that it is the Word of God. And if the and as God spoke His Word, my friend, He promised it. Now, the question is this. What is 2 Peter chapter 1 a quotation of? What's it a direct quote of? And if we go back to our text this evening, I've lost my place. I'm trying to get there quickly. In Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6, the Bible says, The voice said, Cry. And He said, What shall I cry? Well, all flesh is as grass. Uh, now, I'm in the wrong passage of Scripture right here, but I want to go to 2 Peter chapter 1 and uh, verse 24. I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Um, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 24. The Bible says, well, let's go back to verse 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. And what's that next phrase? In verse 23, I'll wait till people get there. I see everybody scrambling. I took you back to Isaiah 40, back to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Okay, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. In verse 8, 
verse 6, 7, and 8, we see that Isaiah 40 is what Peter is quoting. In verse 8 of Isaiah 40, he says, The grass withered, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. Now let me ask you a simple question. Is Peter talking about the spoken word of Jesus Christ Himself? Or is he speaking of the word of God? Well, let's look at verse 20. But the word of God endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Did Peter have a bit of a notion that he was being literally inspired by God the Holy Spirit to pen the Scripture when he wrote 1 Peter chapter 1? By the way, he didn't call it chapter 1, verse 24, when he wrote this letter. <laughs> Did he have an inkling that God was speaking through him? He said, this is the Word of God which is spoken unto you. And he quotes, the Word of God is preserved forever. Now, friend, I don't mean to pick on anybody or be unkind about anything. But this book is everything that we have. It's, it is way, way, way longer for this world than even we are. In other words, I don't know how long I'm going to live, and I'm not particularly concerned with that, to be quite truthful with you. I've prayed at times in my life and asked the Lord to give me a certain amount of time to serve the Lord Jesus. I felt like as though if God did that, that'd be enough. That would be enough for me. I've never felt as though I've done enough for Jesus, but I want to have eternal rewards. I want my life to count. I want it to matter. I, I, I don't want to live in vain. I understand all of that, but I'll just tell you something. I do recognize that it's not going to be very long and I will be very, very irrelevant because I won't be around. It's amazing how, how you know, you sit down and you think, you know, the world turned before I was born, amazingly enough, and it'll probably continue to rotate uh, after I'm gone. And I won't matter. I didn't matter before I came. I won't matter after I'm gone. But God's Word did and God's Word will. Amen. We spent a lot of time harping on our opinions, emphasizing what we think, and really trying to make an impression that represents us. Some people try to live after they die, don't they? Rich people oftentimes will... Uh, start a college or a foundation, have a scholarship, or put their name on a big plaque somewhere. And the reason is they want to be remembered past their age. I'll just tell you something. Yeah, that isn't much of an impression, if it's any at all. You know, somebody very kind, I was thinking about this earlier, somebody very, very kind gave me a scholarship when I was in college. I was in Christian college, I was in the ministry, and I was sick one day, and I was in the Graf Center, or I was playing sick, one or the other. I was in the Graf Center, and I, 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 when I went to pay my bill, I found out there was, I don't remember if it was 500 or 1500 see the, the terrible ingratitude that's in me? But $500 or $1,500 of my bill was paid, and I tried to figure out why, and I found out that I'd had a scholarship the day I was in the Graf Center. It was publicly announced in chapel that I'd won a scholarship. And I'll just tell you something, I forgot about it until just like a year or so ago, and I thought, man, you know, I got a scholarship one time. I was, you know, it wasn't for academics or anything smart. It was just, it was just random. You know, <laughs> folks, it just happened to me. But you know something? Some kind person who had passed away, someone in their name, had actually sponsored me in college. And, you know, I think about it, I think, you know, I don't mean to be ungrateful, but I don't know who, whose name that scholarship was given to me in the name of, and I don't even know how much it was for. Perhaps maybe I should do a little research. I wrote a, I did write a note, a thank you note to somebody, but I don't remember who it was to. Now think about this. Somebody's doing something, and it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It helped me, but I don't even remember them. I don't even remember who they were. If you and I think that we're going to have a legacy or leave something behind us, my friend, we better make something out of this book. We better leave this. And you know it would be okay if we just did it like John the Baptist and who, when he said the servant isn't greater than his master. In other words, so what if people were following Jesus instead of following me? Hey, his disciples found out, hey, he's making more disciples than you are, John. You know, you've got competition here. No, 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 we don't have competition. If we think we've got competition, if we think that anybody needs to see us on the way to the cross, if we see that, think that anybody needs to, to, uh, to get around us, on the way to Jesus, we're mistaken, my friend. What we need to do is lift this light in a dark place up. We need to lift it up high. We need to let people see it. We need to make a whole lot out of it. We may need to make a whole lot of nothing out of us. When you exalt this word, over here on the wall, we have Psalm 138 too, the second part of it. This has been the theme of our ministry. 
uh, when Pastor uh, Phil Rizzo started his church up in uh, in uh, Hoboken, New Jersey, he said, you know, I, I ripped off, I hope it's okay, I ripped off your church's thing. Well, we got it from the Bible, so it wasn't ours. And he said, you know, we got the same slogan, praise thy name for thy loving kindness and thy, for thy truth, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. We started this ministry, we thought, well, what do we want to accomplish in, in planting a church in South Florida, Southeast Florida? I used to think, well, I want a church that will outlive me. In other words, I want to plant a church, and I want that church to be a legacy after me. I have many, many dear friends who are preachers of the gospel, whom God greatly used in their lifetime, and immediately as soon as the leadership in their church changed, that church was not what it once was. Mm -hmm. It just changed. And it's not a reflection on that person's ministry. It's just the fact that people change. Churches change, but God's Word doesn't change. And I came to the conclusion, I thought, well, it would be a great thing if Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church someday had a 100-year anniversary and was still preaching the Word of God. It wouldn't matter in the least bit if it wasn't preaching the Word of God. You know, it actually doesn't really matter if Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church has a 100-year anniversary. It matters whether or not the Word of God is still preached. Amen. That really helped me a lot. It helped me to understand goals and purpose and reason and focus for ministry. I don't need to leave a legacy or leave something behind. I don't need to establish something that will be a testament that Pastor Price did something. I need to preach this book and get out of the way. So what we need to do as believers, my friend, we need to understand that this is a perfect book and it's an eternal book. And we need to just lift it up and we just need to exalt it. God said, I've hey, you ever pondered on that, that statement, you ever sat sat still and thought about, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name? When God magnifies his word above his name, is that pretty high? Mm. Is that fairly exalted? Is that an amazing statement? Mm -hmm. I think so. And so I would submit to you, Christian, that this book is our final authority. It's everything. Any ministry that de-emphasizes this book or just doesn't have time for it isn't a ministry at all. Anyone who preaches anything that isn't this book is a person who preaches something that is either not true or unimportant. Because this is, this is what's special. This is what's amazing. And we just need to lift it up higher and higher and higher. So much so that it's up high enough that you don't see us. You see Jesus. Yeah. That's what will happen if this word is preached. You know, I think as a church, it's something we need to emphasize more and more and more and more. It's something we need to talk about more and more and more. We need to be careful to make sure that, first of all, that the copy that we have reflects that belief. You know that in the English language, and I'm not making this up, I can substantiate it. In the English language, this is the only copy of the Scripture that the individuals that God used to translate it believed that it was preserved. This is the only book in the English language, the only copy in the English language, the only translation that the people God used to translate it actually believe that God's preserved His Word. Every other translation believes that, that there's mistakes in the Word of God. I reject all those translations for that exact reason. God's Word is preserved. Friend, it's that which is to be emphasized. And I think as we're preaching through Isaiah and we're looking at the character of God, that we do well to look at the very thing that Peter wrote to indicate that God on purpose gave His Word and preserved His Word. That God's Word would endure forever. And he is quoting Isaiah chapter 40. When Peter quotes Isaiah chapter 40, he's saying, I believe in the authority of Scripture and I believe in the preservation of the Scripture. And then following it up, he said, and this is the Word. He said, I also believe that what I'm writing right now is on par. It's the same thing that it'll be forever. Isn't that an amazing portion of the Scripture? Mm -hmm. Friend, I, if that isn't one of those truths that make you feel good, I've I just failed. I'm no Joel Osteen. I don't know what to tell you. The fact of the matter is, is <laughs> I am no Joel Osteen. <laughs> I, by the way, I haven't been compared to Joel Osteen in a long time, and I'm kind of glad about it. You know, I almost thought about growing like a, you know, long hair or something, getting longer than mullet because of all the people who used to compare me. I'm serious. Every time I'd do a wedding somewhere, some charismatic person would call and say, you know, you remind me of Joel Osteen. And if you tell me that, I'll do something about it. <laughs> it's not nice. But the reality of it is it makes me want to mess up his hair. Just, just being told that. <laughs> See, we're right in the middle of being serious and I got silly. Let's, let's get back and quit, shall we? The fact of the matter is, is that God's Word, God's Word is preserved and it is forever. And Peter understood it and he quoted it. And friend, it ought to make you feel good to know that you have a book that you can count on. That, that, that if you live the way the Word of God says you ought to live, 
that it won't turn out wrong. I don't know how many Christians say, well, yeah, but you know, I mean, you try and do that, you know what will happen? I'm telling you, you can, you can obey this book and God will honor it. It will bless it. There are so many things in my life, and I don't, I don't mean to go on and on, but there are so many things in my life that have come down to simple, do you believe God or don't you believe God? And I followed Him in faith, and God has honored it. You know, I think that God doesn't do supernatural things in the lives of a lot of Christians because they don't believe in a supernatural book. That is true. And so they disobey God instead of believing Him by faith. It all comes down to what you believe about this book. Is it inspired? Is it preserved? And do you have it today? Well, you start with the question, did it claim to be inspired and preserved? And do you, did it claim that you have it today? And I would say to that, the answer is a resounding yes. It says what it means, means what it says. And anyone who isn't, isn't doing private interpretation will agree with that. Isn't so? Amen. God, thank you for what you've taught us this evening. I ask you to help us to lift up your word. I ask that you would help us by what the truth of the scripture has said tonight to make such an impression on us that we would preach it to others and encourage them and be a help as a result of it. I pray that as a result of it, we would understand the simplicity of the gospel better and believe in the power of your word and the power of your spirit and the power of your preacher to see people come to Jesus. We thank you for it in his name. Amen. 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 Thanks for your good attention this evening. I want to take a, a, just a minute or so for, uh, for some prayer requests.